Hello and welcome to the Car Canada Reviews channel and welcome to the 2023 Toyota GR86. And in this video, I'm going to share with you why I think this model started out really good, but then it's going a little cold. And the reason for that is it might have to do with the GR Corolla. Let's talk about this car and you'll find out why. Let's take a look under the hood of the 2023 Toyota GR86. Now, there's something very interesting when you open the hood and you look at it. To me, it brings old nightmares from the days of the valve spring recall of the Scion FRS. But to everybody else, this is an internal joke, by the way, Toyota D4S Boxer Subaru. This right there basically tells you how this collaboration went. Toyota brought their D4S system, which is a direct and port injection at the same time, and Subaru brought the Boxer, and here is this car that is born. This engine is, to me, just a modified version of the previous one. I mean, everywhere I look, it looks exactly the same, even down to the layout, down to everything. Now, they do do a lot of changes on the inside, and some of them are actual improvements that make sense. This engine is the TA24D. Now, Subaru did use variable versions of this engine in their other models, did not have the D4S, hence the D. Those versions will be turbocharged and they will only have direct injection. So I suppose this engine has the upper hand when it has both direct and port injection at the same time. A relatively reliable system from Toyota, although the earlier versions in this engine did make a lot of noise, and this one is no exception. Extremely loud system in this, and the installation, even though they put a lot of covers and whatnot, it is very lackluster. That's the word I'm gonna use here. So this engine, basically they solved a few problems and they created a few ones. That is my best assessment of this engine. So in the previous engine, and what, if you've worked on boxers before, Splitting the cylinder block was a nightmare. Basically, you have two pieces connected together, the sealer in between them, and then the crank sits in the middle, and then you have pistons going both ways. Well, in the previous engine, in the TA20, you could actually remove the pistons and expose the rod bearings, which is super common to go, without splitting the case. Well, this engine, they decided that was too easy. They wanted to make it more complicated. So they decided to change the complete design of the crank and the rods where the rods are no longer serviceable. You literally have to split the case, pull the case apart, pull the rods with the crankshaft, then you can service them. It absolutely makes no sense. They say they did it for better balancing and all that engineering jargon, but basically that's not a good idea. This is not a race car. You can't make decisions like that on a day-to-day -day car, but they did, and that's okay. It's not the end of the world. One of the common things with this previous version of this engine was oil starvation, rod knock, and people always wondered, why did that happen? I mean, it's a Subaru engine. Subarus are, you know, they make decent cars. Well, here's what happened with that engine. You take this on a track, it uses very thin oil. You drive it very fast, you get it very hot. Oil gets so thin and gets so hot, and you're flying down the track, pushing this thing to the limit because it's not a very fast car. So you're gonna easily push it to the limit without getting scared. You take sharp corners, long corners. All the oil will just pull to one side and you basically have oil starvation for the other side. Then you take another corner and the opposite side, you starve the other side, eventually something's gotta give and the rods usually give. In this engine though, they did two things that are directly meant to address that very specific issue. First thing, this engine has an oil cooler. And to me, looking at the location of that oil cooler, it just, you could, can imagine, you can easily integrate that into the TA20 from the previous generation. But then the other things they did that are equally more important to me, internally, cooler, yeah, maybe you could add an external cooler in the other one and whatnot, but the baffling. So I've been inside the previous engine and I remember the voids, the open, giant open areas where oil could just slosh around. In the front, giant front timing cover, by the way, is scary to remove. And then in the valve covers. So 
In the valve covers, they put baffles, so when the oil wants to slosh around and move all to one side, these baffles will stop it from doing that. Same thing in the front timing cover. That is smart. They actually, in a way, acknowledged the problem with the previous one and resolved it in this one. And that's what you want when you buy a new version of a car with a new version of an engine. And then something else that they did to this that is just beyond me. They made the cylinder wall liners thinner and they claim they wanted things to be lighter weight, but then they went ahead and put a heavier automatic transmission. These are the things that one department does and that the other department don't get the memo. Folks, cars are not designed in the same shed. Uh, usually one team designs one thing, another team designs something else, and a whole other team puts everything together, and a whole other team figures out how we're gonna manufacture this effectively. That's how car manufacturing works. So. They put thinner liners here to reduce weight, and then we move to the automatic transmission, which is one of the two options in this car. The automatic transmission, for lack of a better word, is exactly the same as the previous generation, except third gear ratio has changed and the torque converter stall ratio have changed. In English, they're exactly the same. But somehow, miraculously, it gains six pounds. Six pounds in a car like this, that's a lot. And whatever weight you save from the thin liners, it's not six pounds. Let's just go over that. Any machine shop folks out there, you cannot put thinner liners and lose or gain six pounds. That's not going to happen. So that kind of doesn't make sense. But that's what they did. But then we talk about the manual transmission, which for all intents and purposes, is exactly the same as well. Few ratios have changed, but there's one thing about the previous one that was just really a problem, the manual transmission. Not only was the clutch fragile, the synchros were extremely fragile. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I see a Scion FRS with no second gear. Why? Because the synchros are gone. But then Subaru, in their infinite wisdom, decided it was not second gear, it was fourth gear that needed reinforcement. So they did something very cool, except only for fourth gear. I wish they did it for all the gears. They put a carbon synchro for fourth gear only, because in their mind, when you're on a racetrack, that is the most shift that you will use. You will always be going into fourth at full force. In my opinion, I think it's second gear. This is not for a long track. You're not gonna take this, that doesn't really make a lot of power, on a track with very long runs. Everybody is gonna overtake you. This is for a short track. Basically, the straights are short, and then there's a lot of corners. Then this car really comes to life because this is a super lightweight car, handles super well, but it's not very fast on the straights. There is a use for a car like that, like an autocross. Well, that fourth year goes out of play in this case. So that kind of defeats the purpose of reinforcing fourth gear. I don't get it. The number one failure in the previous generation was second gear, and it does make sense. That's the gear you're gonna be really hammering on when you're in a short track autocross setting, not fourth gear. And then the problem is you get in this car, manual transmission, you drive it, the clutch is extremely aggressive for a car that doesn't really make a lot of power. I mean, you put a regular Corolla clutch in this, it'll take it because this doesn't make a lot of power. You're not gonna burn that clutch. This is not a high power car to put such an aggressive clutch. The clutch is super aggressive in this. And then the transmission. Very, very clunky, Ex exactly like the FRS. The ships are very notchy and just not smooth. But then you get to fourth gear, buttery smooth. It's just a reminder of, hey, we could have made this good, but we decided not to. We just, just fourth gear. Absolutely makes no sense. And this is the part where this really starts to show its ugly face. Let's take a look underneath the 2023 GR86. The first thing you notice, of course, everything is covered up. That's nothing new. But actually, this is very similar to the previous model with one change. All this cover is very identical, except the drain plug access is now actually covered. Before it used to be open, now it's covered with three bolts. I suppose that's not too bad. If you want to drain the radiator though, 
you have to remove this entire thing. If I remember correctly, the previous generation actually had a little door where you could drain the coolant. Didn't work very well, but at least you had access to it. This one, they took that access away. At the end of the world. We look at the front suspension. This is actually Subaru, business as usual. This is a very lightweight car, so you notice the control arm is just a single sheet of metal. It's not double, it's single. And then the ball joint is part of it. You can't separate it. That's, I suppose, is the design Subaru loves to use. Two piston caliper. Actually, the brakes are smaller on this new generation than the previous one, but they are super potent because this is a very lightweight car. Something interesting though, the knuckle is steel. There's a lot of steel parts here, and this, if this was aluminum, this would be even lighter, but that's what they decided to do here. As we make our way back, this cover is actually identical to the previous generation. You got a catalytic converter. This is actually the cleanup catalytic converter, not the main one. This cover is very identical, very flimsy, loves to fall off, so be careful. And then this actually makes a difference in the noise level, so if this does fall off, remember to replace it. As we make our way back, everything is well covered. However, the tunnel is just wide open. There is no covering here, nothing. And the CNR application, I guess, uh, these have a few spots that don't look too nice. Not something I'm used to looking at Toyotas, but again, this is Subaru, so that's how they do things. Drive shaft here is a little bit modified, it's lighter weight. These didn't really have issues with the drive shaft, even the previous generation. Very simple, you have a little center support bearing right here. And that's really about it. We look at this shield, and there's something very curious about it. You notice this blue tape. I don't know if this is something that was supposed to be removed, but it was not at the factory, but it looks like it's starting to melt. So uh, I wonder what that is. Because I haven't seen it. We've reviewed a 22. I don't remember seeing that tape. And I see it here. It's melting and falling off. Maybe they forgot to remove it at the factory. Perhaps. Rear end, very similar, actually exactly the same as the previous generation. Really didn't have many problems, very simple to service. Here's the drain plug, it's a fill plug, very, very simple. Fully independent rear suspension, of course, we're talking about a sports car here, and works pretty good. This car actually handles super well for, for what it is. It is very lightweight, doesn't have a lot of power, but it handles super well. And you feel it the minute you take off in this car, it just, it's a little bit on the rigid side where it's a little jarring, but it at least handles well. And this goes back to uh, the F-Sport of Lexus where they love to make cars jarring and don't handle well. This one actually does handle well. So you put up with a jarring ride, but you'll have fun driving this. Now the exhaust, and this is the interesting part. Exhaust comes here and then it's actually single exhaust and splits into two. Sounds very, very nice for car that doesn't make a lot of power, it actually does sound pretty nice. Let's take a listen to how that sounds like. It does sound pretty good, especially when it's cold. I wish it had some kind of cutoff, a switch or whatnot, but it does sound pretty loud when it's cold, actually. Rear brakes are single piston caliper. They are actually also smaller than the previous generation. They do have integrated parking brake in the rotor hat because this is a mechanical parking brake, not electronic. Works pretty good. I like it. There is a couple things that are pretty interesting about this car. And this is where things, you can tell they did this well. I mean, they did this, it has to be said, better than the Supra. If you look here, this, is an actual brake vent. Because when you look here, you have openings of the brake vent. This is an actual brake vent, and so is this one. There you have openings here, and then openings in the front. Folks, these are actual vents that are functional. Even the Supra, the GR Supra, they have this stuff closed off. It absolutely makes no sense, but that's how they did it. Now. Subaru uses a different style of TPMS sensor. There is a sensor behind this. It's rubber, so I'm assuming it is two-piece TPMS sensor, which is good. Unlike Toyota, occasionally will still use the old style where it's one piece. This one over is two-piece, which is nice. Let's take a look at the outside of the 2023 GR86. And the first thing is, if we look at this front end, 
I can't help but uh, think this reminds me of this car, or at least it's inspired by. Nonetheless, it is a pretty good looking car. If it's actually inspired by the Jaguar F-Type, it's a pretty good looking car. One thing I love about the look of this car, it looks more mature. The previous one felt like it had aftermarket accessories on it, and that's how it had that look. This one looks right, looks the part, it is pretty nice. You look at, of course, the GR badge right here, very, very proud and pronounced in the front, looks pretty cool. And then we look at this deal, which is really nice when you're driving. So you have a high part here that it dips down, same thing on the other side. When you're driving, you can actually see those and they almost look like two muscles sticking out. Looks pretty cool. I really like how this looks. Headlights are adaptive. So basically the lens of the headlight has a motor that turns it as you turn. Pretty cool. It's really something I wish every car has. Makes lighting extremely good in these. Then as we wrap around the side, the side at the top is pretty featureless. It's just straight, nothing really about it. I do like these wheels. I think they look really nice, especially with the silver color. Then we have a small accessory right next to the wheel. This is an addition. This is an accessory that says big GR here in non-color. It kind of emphasizes this vent, which is an actual vent that works, as we looked at when we looked underneath it. Pretty cool. This is uh, interesting, I suppose, the small little touches. As we walk around, there's one visual thing on the side that I really like. If you look in this area, you have this dip and then this little fin that sticks out. It looks super cool. I really like how that looks. It just, it looks proper, it looks nice. It's the little touches that look nice. And then of course, we have the uh, compliance flap, pretty big and uh, yeah. If you don't know what the, what the compliance flap is, in the US, certain cars require that their wheel do not stick out from the car a certain amount. So when they do, they do have this little compliance flap. That's just what they did. Then we look at the back and to me, the back really looks good. I mean, the previous model looks like it was an aftermarket tail light, just didn't look right, but in this, it just looks proper, looks really nice. I really think this is a really nice back end. It looks very nice. Now, of course we have the GR written here, then 86. I suppose that is nice. I like the fake, it is not really a continuous tail light, but it does have this black trim that it runs across, looks pretty cool. The fuel door has a very odd, interesting shape but that's what they decided to do. It's a little, I don't know what to describe. What would you describe this shape as? Not really sure, but it's a pretty interesting shape. The spoiler over here, I think it looks pretty cool. It just, it's not too big, but it's not too small. I mean, a car like this, this is a car people's car. You want things like that to make you happier. But one thing absolutely doesn't match or fit this car is the shark fin. I feel like if it was not there, this would look better because you have the wing and then you have this shark fin, which is a massive shark fin from a minivan. I don't think it looks good. And then you have the dip in the roof and this kind of interrupts it. I don't think it looks very cool, but that's what uh, manufacturers are doing these days. Now there is something about the trunk, which is pretty cool. You do have a little button here to open it. Trunk size is actually pretty decent. The entrance is pretty small and that's, that's what the, the sports cars, you know, you're not, this is not a car to have a big trunk, but it is actually a pretty usable trunk. Underneath this, we have the uh, worst thing in the planet, the inflate kit. Of course, this doesn't have a spare tire. Although, just looking at this space here, it almost looks like you could put a spare tire here, but in Toyota land, they decided not to put one. Something interesting about this trunk, you can program a code that you press the button a number of times and it'll actually open the trunk even if you don't have the keys. Say so your keys are inside the house, you came out to get something, you can actually punch in your code and you can open the trunk. That is pretty cool. Little stuff that really matter. Let's take a look at the interior of the 2023 Toyota GR86. And there is a small theme here. And this is 
Something very interesting about cars. When a manufacturer is trying to convince you that the car is a serious car, but it actually isn't, or a special version of a car, but it actually isn't, is when they throw the badges everywhere. And there's something, the minute you walk into this, GR, GR, everywhere. The floor mats, GR. The steering wheel, GR. The start button, GR. And then just if that's not enough, as soon as you start the car, GR logo, and then you go to shift your shifter, it says GR on it. This is the problem with cars that, that supposedly are this developed by their special division, but it actually isn't. I don't think this was really developed by GR, because if you get in a Corolla GR, the GR Corolla, that is really developed by them, because they don't put badges and in, in visual things. They actually do changes, which this one did not get those changes. But let's get past that. Let's look at this interior. Comparing this to the previous generation, this is a massive improvement. I think things here are nice. They're not exotic in any way, shape, or form. This is not a luxury car in any way, shape, or form. But the materials are better, the fit finish and better. It doesn't feel extremely cheap like the previous one. This is not the quietest car in the world, but it is a lot quieter than the previous generation. And something about this car, this is a car you're gonna actually drive daily and occasionally take it on a track. It'll be fun, take it to some back roads without exceeding the speed limits because this is not a dangerous car to drive. So it is a nicer place to be, especially when you get into higher trims. It is really nice inside. Now, there are a few things that are interesting. Uh, there is nothing here Toyota. Everything is Subaru. And this is similar to the previous generation. That's not a bad thing. Subaru actually makes decent interiors. You start with the gauge. It's a couple screens. I don't really like screens. However, this one does have a few extra things. You have your G meter, which in a car like this does make sense. They put that in the Camry. It doesn't make sense. In this, it does make sense. You have a proper mechanical handbrake, and that's how it should be in a car like this. Shifter sits right in the middle. I think that the kind of the position of everything is right in this car. You sit in it, it feels right. Then you go in the center here, you have your radio, which is a Subaru radio, not a particularly good one. It's just kind of on the old, the bad old school side. It doesn't really have wireless Apple CarPlay, it does have it wired, but it works, I suppose. So it's the only thing that I actually really like about this screen. When you're driving this car and your hands on the shifter, you're driving manual transmission and your radio is on, you can literally skip the track without even moving your hand right on the screen. You don't even have to do it from the steering wheel. I think that is pretty cool. The position of it is forward and that's nice. But more stuff. And this is where, you see, this is a car for a car guy. And these little touches, they make a difference. There is a row of switches here. Most of them are for the HVAC controls. They're like little toggles. They really look nice and they, they fit. They just play the part. You have three knobs. I love that everything is physical touch button here. There's no stuff through the screen. And that is very nice. And then if you go in the upper models, you even have heated seats. Usually cars like this, you know, heated seats, not, not really something you expect, but you do have them. Something else that I love is the position of this handle and how there is a round hole in the door pocket for round objects to go in. Sorry, we don't talk about those in my channel. But I like how the overall design of, of this section of the door, the switches are slanted up towards you. There's not a lot of cars actually that have that, even sports cars, but this is a classic. It just gives it like a cockpit feel to it. So I like that. There's little touches that are nice, but then there are touches that are not nice. Things like this little console door in the middle. You drive the manual transmission one, which even though I don't really like the manual transmission in this car, but let's say you bought the manual transmission because you want to enjoy it. Every time you're going to put your hand a lot here, shift your gear. Every time you sit here, you're just going to open this little door because the switch happens to be right in your way. So eventually you're going to get tired. You're going to leave it open and now you're sitting in the hole. I wish they uh, moved this button somewhere else, maybe on the side or something, but it's right in your way. So you're always going to be opening this. There's no way around it. And then we talk about the back seat. Now you buy a car like this, you're not expecting back seats. They're basically to put your backpack or whatever. 
but this does have back seats. They're unusable. Forget it. Don't, don't even think about it. But the interesting thing is this has actual sensors in the back seats to remind you of your rear seat passengers as if they're whining and complaining of their cramped legs for sitting in the back. It's not enough to remind you that there are passengers in the back. This is where like auto manufacturers, they just have a mold. They, they put, it's kind of like the settings apply to all. And this one gets it as well. This is, by the way, Subaru's part. They have the back seat warning sensors and they just apply to all models. And this one got it as well. It doesn't make sense. I wish they would have got rid of that, lowered the price a little bit, and life is good. Speaking of the price, this car is exactly the same as the BRZ. Maybe some of the option configurations and whatnot are different. But for some reason, this one is cheaper at the base level. I don't know why, but... That's just how they decided to do this. I guess Subaru felt like their car was worth more, their badge was worth more than Toyota. But then more on the technical side of things. This is all Subaru here. The wiring, behind the scenes, everything here is Subaru land. Nothing Toyota here, and that's okay. Subaru usually don't have electrical gremlins or problems, so that's okay. Subaru usually have good or Actually, borderline excellent fit and finish, and you really see that here. Materials are nice, even the plastics, they don't feel like cheap plastic as you're about to break as soon as you look at it. It does feel nice, and that is really welcome. But then there are some interesting Subaru things. See, the previous generation, the safety systems, they were Toyota systems. Here, they're all Subaru. So this model with a manual transmission, actually for that matter, all manual transmission models, they don't have any safety systems. No cruise, radar cruise control, no lane keep assist, none of that. That doesn't exist. You can go buy a Corolla with hubcaps and it'll have that standard, but this does not have that if you have a manual transmission. If you have an automatic transmission and if you have a higher trim, then you get Subaru's excellent, and it is actually excellent, eyesight system, which basically doesn't use a radar sensor. It uses a camera that sits right on top of the mirror and that's what does everything. It works really good. I've had a chance to test it out. It is really good. But again, in a car like this, perhaps the safety systems are not as essential. Maybe that's why they only put it in the automatic, but it still doesn't make sense. Should have been available as an option everywhere, but it is not. But something because of that, you notice, all newer cars, they have some kind of safety systems. You look around the mirror, there's always like this big plastic bezel around it. This one doesn't have anything. It's just wide open, it's like an old school car. And I guess that kind of adds to the character of this car. Let's talk about some things I do not like about the GR86. And unfortunately, there is plenty. The first thing I don't like about the GR86 is the GR Corolla. Why would anyone buy this when there is a GR Corolla? I understand the GR Corolla is more expensive, but it's also faster, more fun, original, and it has four doors. This is the problem when you have cars like this overshadowed by its bigger brother, or actually smaller brother, it depends how you look at it. Because when we look at this, Let's talk about the manual transmission situation. This is a fun car. People will want to buy it in a manual transmission, yet it is not executed well. The clutch is too aggressive, the shifter is very hard, and the fourth gear is very smooth. You go to a GR Corolla, everything is very well. And then the whole GR thing. This is a Subaru with a fake GR badge. The GR Corolla is a proper GR car, ground up, all exclusive. There is hardly anything exclusive about this, folks. And then there is the biggest problem with this car that people really voice an opinion about and they still don't want to address it. The car is simply underpowered. Now, I do disagree with some of the comments about it being underpowered. This is not meant to be your traffic light to traffic light warrior. This is meant to be on your track warrior on a track that doesn't have long straights. Autocross. This handles super well. Why? Because it's super lightweight. It has adequate power for what it is to make it very fun without ruining your driving record, without you ending up in a ditch. However, if you're really uncareful, you can still end up in a ditch. This is still real, real drive. But the problem is they could have done better. 
They changed the engine completely to fix some stuff, ruin some other stuff. But they could have given this a little bit more power, maybe put a turbocharger, maybe take an engine out of a WRX and put it here, at least make a hot version of this. Make this the Toyota 86 and then make a GR version of it where you have a giant turbocharged engine that makes 300 plus horsepower and now we're talking but they didn't. And instead, for 2023, you have the fake GR special, a 10th anniversary, like anybody really cares about the 10th anniversary of the Scion FRS. We have a 10th anniversary version with its own special paint and special decals and special bolt-on exhaust. They're going at this the same way they did the TRD Camry, makes absolutely no sense. And this, unfortunately, in my opinion, is what's gonna make this car, which I think they really updated some things and they started heading the right way, it's gonna make it die out. Just like many other sports cars died out because the manufacturer simply decided, we're not gonna to put too much time and effort into it. Casing point right here. So should you buy a 2023 GR86 and is this a true GR model? Folks, the biggest problem with this model in 2023 is the arrival of the GR Corolla that heavily overshadows this. Now this in 2022, when it first got updated and continues on for 2023, it really got a good update in my opinion. Yes, some things didn't go very well with the update, but hey, nothing is perfect. They really did well with the update. Things are more mature, it looks better, drives better, doesn't have as much power still, transmission is still clunky, but overall it was a, an improvement. But the problem is that improvement is heavily overshadowed by the arrival of a true special model. And in 2023, we only have a 10th anniversary model in, kind of introduced. Not hardly the special edition of this, it just has some stickers, special color, and some cutback exhaust. This is not a true GR car because it's a Subaru engine and basically a Subaru with a Toyota D4S system. It's exactly the same as the BRZ. It doesn't give it exclusivity. And while it is still a very fun car to drive and the prices are lower slightly than the BRZ, a lot lower than the GR Corolla, but there are other options out there that potentially would be better, equally priced. One of those options would be the Mazda Miata. And if you're gonna spend that much for a nice one of these, you get into the mid thirties, might as well stretch your budget, might be a little bit more and get something truly special like the GR Corolla. Folks, I hope this video is helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel, check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, May the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have yourself a wonderful day.